Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm just so grateful to be in this house and to be in this room. I'm so thankful for this church that represents you so well. I'm grateful for the fact that they're there to tell your story in a world that many times is indifferent and seems like it doesn't care. But yet every week, they're bold to tell it, to let people know that there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a God who loves people so passionately. And so, Father, I thank you for your blessing upon this ministry. And I thank you today, Lord, that you're going to elevate this ministry. We all come from different backgrounds, but we all have similar needs. And today, Lord, I thank you, whatever those needs are, you're going to minister to them, you're going to touch them, and you are going to help us to be more like Jesus than ever before. In Jesus' name. Well, uh, today I didn't realize it, but apparently uh, I've come as uh, a representative of the app Croak. I, I, I didn't realize that, that that's what I was doing because I'm going to talk to you about questions about death. <laughs> and, and that's my subject matter. I, I, I didn't realize I was going to get introduced that way. Uh, I've really never heard an offering being ta- talked about from the dead first, but hey, it was really remarkable there. Good job there. Uh, <laughs> But I do want to talk to you about some questions about death. In my ministry, I've literally held the hands of 17 people when they've taken their last breath on this planet. I remember all of them. I remember what it was to be in the room, remember their lives, remember that last breath. 17 times. During those times, I realized that I always have been asked questions by the family. I've always been asked questions by people who do believe and don't believe. And it's some of those questions I want to navigate you through. See, the Bible's clear about our journey here on earth. And what it's clear about is that our journey on earth begins with the day that we are born. And our journey on earth ends the day that we die. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, apparently before uh, the app croak was around, God said, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. It's the last part of that that people tend to struggle with, this thing called death. What is it? What is it like? Why is it such an uncomfortable conversation? And it's that last part Not that we're born, but we die that all the questions center around. But one of the things I've learned in life is the questions we ask the most is where our faith is needed the most. So if something's just a passing question, it really doesn't cause a whole lot of introspection. But if something is one of those questions that everyone asks, then it's going to require some faith. So the Bible's crystal clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, that particular verse is, is talking about death. And what it's saying is, is we walk by faith and not by sight. If you've ever been in the room when someone passes away, here's what your sight tells you. It's over. It's done. They're gone. That's what you see. It's over, they're dead, they're gone. But see, faith moves it to a different level because that verse goes on in the next verse and it says, we walk by faith and not by sight because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so our sight says it's done, it's over, but our faith says they're now with the Lord. So the most difficult question that any of us face requires faith for us to answer it. We navigate that moment. We look at that moment. And in the midst of it, our sight tells us one thing, but our faith tells us something else. Now what the Bible says is the answer to the questions that most people have asked me in my journey as a pastor, that they're really hid within us. See what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, eternity has been hid in our hearts. See, inside you, there's something that tells you that there's something bigger than this life. It says that God put within us an eternal clock. 
that says that this isn't it, that there's more to it than this, that there's something bigger than this, that there's something greater than this, and it says that eternity is there. And what the Bible says is, is that you are not disposable. See, when I finish this, this bottle, I'm going to throw it away. It's disposable to me. But God says, I created you and you're not disposable. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, it says in there, it says that God has sanctified you holy spirit, soul, and body. So to add perspective to that, those two dogs that your pastor loves so much, they're wonderful creatures. But you're unique from them. Because you're the only part of creation that has a touch of God in you. That you were created with a spirit, and you were created with a soul, and you have a physical body. Those two wonderful puppies out there, they have a body and they have a soul, but they don't have a spirit. They weren't made in the image and likeness of God. They weren't made to connect to God. They weren't made to relate personally to God. Because we know in John chapter 4 and verse 24, it says God is spirit. And so we understand the distinction there. And see, God hid eternity in your heart because you're a spirit being. And your spirit and your soul aren't disposable. God doesn't look at them and just say, hey, when, when life's over, they're done. But because you're not disposable, there's a responsibility that you can't evade. And that responsibility is found in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. And in there it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day. God's sitting there, he's saying, all creation, everything that was created is one day going to answer this question. And the question is, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, you choose. You cannot evade the fact that you are responsible You cannot ignore the responsibility that you have because your decisions have eternal consequences. You're not deciding where you're going to lunch. You're not deciding whether you're gonna buy this car or that car. There are some decisions that you're going to make and those decisions that you're going to make are going to have eternal consequences and they're gonna be bigger than this life. And God said, I've given you a choice. It's around you every day. You can choose heaven. You can choose something else. You can choose life. You can choose death. But every part of creation is gonna stand and recognize you had a choice. And that choice cannot be ignored. See, for a Christian, death isn't permanent. That's why we're told in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, it says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. But then it starts off with the first of four comparisons, and it says, and death and life. And as I like to tell congregations, no one would write that verse that way. We would write it, you're more than conquerors in life and death. But God uses the word death first. Why does he say you're more than conquerors in death and life? He does it because he's saying that there is life after death. And so in the midst of that, you're turning around and you're looking. But the Bible gives us clarity. There's a story I want us to look at. It's in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 22. And it says, and there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen fair. So that was just the inside style. He did his life very well. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. Now, in this story, you have two men, you have two lives, and you have two decisions. So you have two men, 
One on earth seemed to do very well. One on earth seemed to do not so well. You have two lives. One man had the best of everything. Another man had the worst of everything. But then you have two decisions. The Bible tells you about the man who was incredibly poor that he's going to be carried off into Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's bosom is just a precursor to what we call heaven because at that time Jesus hadn't come, hadn't died on the cross and made the sacrifices. But the other man, the rich man, is going to go to hell. Now see, hell's one of those cringe-worthy words that we don't like in church. It makes us uncomfortable. We don't enjoy the concept. Now, we don't mind heaven, but it's the hell part that really bothers us because we just don't get it. We don't understand it. But any of you that have studied the Bible know that the one person who spoke on hell more than any other individual was our Lord and Savior. He spoke more on it than anybody else. You know, as a young kid, I used to wonder, why did Jesus bring this hell word into the factor? Why did he bring it? Why was he so pronounced on it? Why did he tell stories about it? I mean, this is the, the, the person who is loving, who is kind, who is healing, who is restoring, and yet he talked vividly about this. And I never could get it until one day it hit me. Jesus wanted people to know what he was saving them from. He wanted people to get, I'm saving you from this. And for some people, they don't get it because they don't understand hell. Hell is Jesus giving people what they want. And see, what hell is, is that people don't want any of Jesus here so hell is a place where there's no Jesus at all. See, if you can't handle a little bit of Jesus here, why would you want a lot of Jesus up there? I mean, if you can't handle the fact that there's a Christmas and that bothers you, and you can't handle that the name Jesus is mentioned, and you can't handle the fact that someone prays or something, and that bothers you down here, why would you want to be in heaven? Because I don't know if you know, there's a lot of Jesus up there. So if you can't handle a little bit of it, heaven would be hell to you. Because heaven's not politically correct. They're going to talk about Jesus. They're going to sing about Jesus. They're going to proclaim Jesus. They're going to exalt Jesus. That's what heaven is. But see, the reason, the reason hell gets us is because everyone has an Aunt Sally. And see, when, when we talk about the hell part, everyone says, well, what about Aunt Sally? She's just so sweet. She's just so nice. And that's what sticks us is everyone doesn't get Aunt Sally. But everyone forgets that the day that Aunt Sally was born, there would be this thing called Christmas. And even though she may not personally celebrate it, she had friends that celebrated it. She saw all of the things about Christmas. And every year, Christmas was God just whispering to her, I came for you. And so every time she saw a Christmas tree, every time she saw and heard all the songs that were telling and playing different places, it was God whispering in her heart, I came for you. And then as she began to grow, she would hear about people, well, I'm going to Easter services. But every time she would hear about Easter, it was God just whispering to her, I died for you. She would wake up in Seattle and twice a year see the sun. Apparently, God did it just for me, so I'm telling you, at, at 3.20 today, it's going to become dark, because I'm getting on a plane.
But here it is. She sees this beautiful sunrise. And it's God saying, I'm a creator. She sees this gorgeous sunset. And God saying, this is just a glimpse of my glory. And then as she begins to age, she has friends who begin to pass away. And every time she's at a funeral, God whispers to her, I have a plan for you. But at Christmas, she was too busy growing up. At Easter, she just said, I'm going to go on with my life. At every funeral, God whispered, and she just gently said no. All the times that God was trying to reach out to her, she just said no. And people don't realize is that in our world, God has wrapped his presence in it. And people cannot evade the responsibility that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore you choose. My spiritual father who impacted my life more than anyone else, when he was born, he was born with several major heart defects. Back when he was born, there wasn't the medical possibility of any of those being cured like they could be cured today. So it was a miracle that he survived his birth, and it was a miracle that he passed just a few years, but by the time he reached 17 years of age, he was just confined to a bed. And he got to the place that he was not only confined to a bed, but he couldn't really speak, he couldn't really talk very well. He just laid there. He could feel his heart beating in him, and then one day his heart stopped. He tells a story that when his heart stopped, he said it was like someone taking off a shoe. He felt his spirit, that part of him that was made eternal, begin to come out of his body. He said it was like you were slipping off his shoe, and he said as he began to go through his body, he could literally see his body laying there. He could see his sister because he had told his sister, I'm dying, go get mama. But he says at that time, he began to descend. As he descended, it became darker and darker. And as it became dark, he said the darkness was just so thick that it was like you could begin to cut it. And in the midst of that darkness, as he began to talk about it, he said he could look below him and he could see the gates of hell. As he could see the gates of hell, he knew that there was a portal, and if he crossed that portal, he wasn't coming back. But see, he was confused because he went to church, yet he's descending. He had been baptized, yet he's descending. He had gone to Sunday school, yet he's descending. So he starts yelling as loud as he could, I'm a member of the church. I've been baptized, but none of these things. But in the midst of that, as he began to descend, there was a voice that uttered words that he couldn't recognize, and the descent stopped, and he began to ascend. Now, this is going to happen a series of times, and he's not going to get it because, you know, he went to church, he was baptized. But then he's going to realize that just because you go to church doesn't mean you're saved. Just because someone puts you underwater doesn't mean that you were saved. Just because you went to Sunday school. And someone says, but, but why did he get close and didn't come back? It was because when his sister told mama, she began to pray. And she began to cry out. That's one of the things the church needs to understand. Our prayers can't change people's destiny, but they can prolong their opportunity to make a decision. So when I pray for people, I can't decide for them, but I can extend for them an opportunity. Now that being said, 
he ended up making that decision. And no longer did he say, I went to church. He said, I believe in Jesus. No longer did he say, I've been baptized. He said, I believe in Jesus. See, he knew that the greatest question in life can only be resolved by faith. That faith has to be a part of the journey. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. If you've been in that room, sight tells you it's over. Sight tells you it's done. Sight tells you it's gone. But if you're a Christian, your faith says, life's bigger than this. And death isn't the end for a child of God. Now, when Jesus told this story, he wanted us to have some facts about death. The first thing, when Lazarus, the poor man, died, it tells us that when death happens to someone who believes, they're never alone. It says the angels met him and carried him. So someone says, well, what is death like? Death is this. It's like a child being in a car in the back seat. And they're heading home after a long day and they fall asleep in the back seat. Mom and daddy get out of the car, see that they're asleep, they pick them up and they take them in the house and put them in their bed. The child went to sleep in the back seat but woke up in his house. See, for a child of God, the only thing that happens when you die is you close your eyes here but you open your eyes there. So if you're wondering what happens, that's what happens. But you're never alone. It's not as though there's this, this moment and you're, you're sitting there in this darkness. It says immediately the angels came. People say, well, when that happens, what will it be like? Well, in verses 23 and 24 of this same story, what it says is, even though you're absent from your body, you still have bodily form. Because in this story, it talks about how that the rich man looked up. He still had eyes. How he talked about his fingers. How he talked about, hey, could you take a drop of water and put it on my tongue? You don't cease to have form when you leave your body. It's just that whatever you have in your form no longer rules you like our physical bodies do here. See, Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. He said, I don't know if I was in the body or out. He's talking about going to heaven. He says, you're not body conscious. Down here, we're all conscious of everything we feel. It's, it's our biggest impulse. But he said, when you go beyond this realm, you're not consumed with your physical body. You don't know if you're in it or you're out of it because you're focused on things bigger than that. Another thing that happens is not only when someone dies are they not alone, and not only when someone dies they still have form and they still have physical expression, but they have awareness. See, some people say, well, I know. Well, yes, you will know. Because the rich man could look up into Abraham's bosom and he recognized Lazarus. You don't lose your capacity to know. But it's not only that you know and you have awareness, but you know more, not less. See, when you leave your body, you don't get dumber. For some people, that should bring a whole lot of hope. Because it says he looked up and he saw Abraham. He had never seen Abraham before. There were no pictures of Abraham. He didn't know who Abraham was, but he wasn't limited. So you're, not only is there awareness, but you know more, not less. 
But then the man who went to hell, he looked at Abraham and he says, Abraham, could you send someone to talk to my brothers? To warn them. And see, that's the thing. That's the Aunt Sally question. Can you send somebody to warn them? And Abraham said to him, he says, all around them is the answer. They have Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible. They have the prophets. That's the rest of the Old Testament. That's all that they had. We have the entire book of the Bible, all 66 of them. And he says, they all tell them what they need to know. He said, but you need to understand something. When you were alive on earth, you had everything perfect. You were rich, you were wealthy, you had it all together. But now that you've died, Lazarus, who had nothing, is doing well. And see, one of the things we all need to know is the books aren't balanced this side of life. And people look and live this world and they say, well, this world isn't fair. It's not. See, you live in Seattle. You could live in Sudan. You think being a Christian in Seattle's hard? Try to be one in Sudan. They would trade your political problems in a second. Life's not fair. But God doesn't balance the books here. But every day people need to know that all around them, when you can see the mountain, when the sun is shining, every Christmas, every Easter, God's whispering to people's souls. But the decisions they make here determine what's gonna happen after here. You get to choose life or death so choose wisely. Your life consists of two dates. A day you were born, and if Jesus doesn't come back, a day you'll die. You don't control either one of those. All you control is the dash in between. Is that dash going to represent something good, or is that dash going to represent something well? Are people at your funeral after the potato salad's over, are they going to have anything to remember? You get to determine the dash. The people in this room are going to live on average 28,500 days. For those of you that are trying to figure it out, it's about 78 years. Some of you are already beat the house money and you're over. Some of you will not reach it. But that's just the average. You get to decide. There was another story about another Lazarus. It was the Lazarus who was the brother of Mary and Joseph. Jesus was close to the family, and Lazarus died. The sisters were disappointed because they felt like they had seen Jesus heal. Why wasn't he here to heal him? And people sometimes think that the questions we ask today about why here and not here are new, but when Jesus was walking the earth, they had those same questions. Mary and Martha were mad at Jesus. You could have been here. You could have stopped this. But Jesus shows up late three days after. 
And he begins to call Lazarus forth, but before he did, it said he wept. I love what Anne Graham said. She said, I think Jesus cried because he knew that he was asking him to come back from heaven. Never be sad for anybody who went to heaven. They're sad for you that you're here. God set before you life and death. You're not going to get to say, well, I went to experience church. I was baptized. I was dedicated. I was christened. It's only faith that resolves the question. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today that you would do what I can't do. That somehow, Lord, that you would begin to take the greatest question that people have and you would begin to speak to people about it. That with the clarity that you said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore you choose. That people would understand that there is a choice. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that they would hear the whisper of your heart that you came for them. You have a plan for them. And that they will have the kind of faith that resolves the question once for all. So Lord, today, minister to people and help them. Inspire them. Encourage them. But Lord, let them know that you're there for them. In Jesus' name. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around. Three questions. First of all, have you ever taken that journey of faith where you've placed your faith in Christ? Not talking about being a member of a church, not talking about going through confirmation, dedication, going through water baptism, being christened. Do you know that if you were to die today that you would be right with God and go to heaven? Do you know that if you closed your eyes and you took your last breath, that you would open your eyes? See, the Bible says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And if you're not certain of that, today's the day. Today's the day. So while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, do you know? Second question, if you're a person of faith, are you close to him? See, you can believe in him and not be close to him. But Jesus didn't come into your life to be a part of your life. He came into your life to be the center. And if he's not, today's the day. I want to pray with you. But if you can say yes to the first one, you believe in him. Yes to the second one, you're close to him. Then the third question, have you ever received the gift that Jesus told his disciples was so important that they were weighed in an upper room until it happened? And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it talks about being filled with the Spirit. Because if you're going to navigate down here, you not only need to have faith in God for up there, but you need the power of God to live down here. Amen. And if you don't haven't had that moment, you need it. So while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around, any one of those three areas, you know that I'm talking to you. I want to pray with you if you'd like to be a part of that prayer, if you just raise your hand wherever you're at. Any one of those three areas, you know that I'm talking to you. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. You know that I'm talking to you. I see that hand. Anybody else, you know, I see that hand. 
If you raised your hand, I want to pray for you. But I need to pray for you the way that it helps me to help you. And that is, I want to pray for you personally. So I'm going to ask you to stand wherever you're at. I'm going to ask you to come down here. If you're in the balcony, you don't worry about it. We're not talking about where we're going to lunch. We're talking about, are we going to heaven? And so I need you to come on down. And so down here, if you raised your hand, I need you to come down here. Someone said, well, what will people think? This isn't about what people think. This is about what Jesus thinks. Because one day you're not going to stand before me. You're not going to stand before anyone else. You're going to stand before Jesus. And so I need you to do it. So if you raised your hand, if you'll come down here, if you'll, just, if you'll just do that right now, I would appreciate it. You don't worry about anyone, anything. Just come on down here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God loves you so much. God loves you. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. We're waiting, you're up there, you come on down. Jesus loves you so much, he loves you. He loves you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna pray a prayer, and then uh, I'm gonna turn it over to pastor, and he's gonna tell you what to do next. But here's the thing, come on up here, Dennis. I'm going to pray this prayer. Everyone in here is going to pray a prayer because you understand something. Church isn't a spectator sport. You're either receiving in faith or you're helping someone else receive in faith. If you want to be a spectator, go to a movie. But in church, it's about faith. Using our faith, receiving with our faith. So everyone in here is going to pray this prayer. And if everyone in here would lift your hands towards heaven, and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father you, said, you said in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10 verses, 9 10, verses 9 and 10 that if I believe with my heart and, my heart, and confess with my mouth, with my mouth that, Jesus that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Would be saved. Today, I'm that. Today I'm doing that. I believe, I believe that you are my Lord. Therefore, I thank you for saving me and changing my life forever in Jesus' name. And today, Lord, I'm asking you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that when hands are laid on me, I'll instantly receive my heavenly prayer language in Jesus' name. Amen.